So far, we have uh, considered linear regression and uh, Odin least squares estimate from a rather mechanical point of view of how the OLS estimator is computed. So, uh, as the next theme, we will consider the statistical properties and uh, statistical inferences. And to this end, uh, I will want to next uh, clarify a little bit this distinction between theoretical and uh, empirical model that I made earlier. So, recall that when I introduced the ordinary least squares estimator, I already drew this distinction of between uh, theoretical model, uh, which is, uh, includes these uh, Greek uh, letters betas for the coefficient and epsilon for the, for the random error term. So you can think about this theoretical model as a, as a model of how the data are being generated in the real world. And then we have this empirical model with this uh, Latin alphabets B for the, for the intercept and slope coefficient and E for the regression residual. So uh, this is something that we then fit to our empirical data. And, and this distinction is rather important. Uh, uh, so typically, of course, this empirical model that, uh, that uh, can be uh, fitted to our data, but the question then arises that, okay, what can we say about this uh, uh, theoretical model based on our empirical model? And for these purposes, we need statistical inferences and probability theory. To pave away a, a little bit on this, so let me let me go back to some some little couple of steps to the to the introductory statistics. So I believe that some of this is uh, familiar to you, but it's useful to get a quick uh, quick reminder. So I believe this distinction between sample and population is uh, clear to all of you. So the idea usually is that we apply some kind of random sampling to obtain our our uh, our observed data from some larger population and there of course this uh, random sampling is essential because uh, this uh, this uh, then allows us to then use some probability uh, probability theory when we want to make some kind of uh, statistical inferences to say something on the population based on our observed sample so notice that the sample is something where we can uh, apply some kind of sample statistics, we can calculate some sample averages and uh, sample standard deviations and sample covariances. But uh, typically for the population, those kind of statistics are not directly directly known. And this is why we then need to need to do some statistical inferences based on our observed sample. And indeed, this I, I mentioned, but I mentioned again, the random sampling has a critical role because without random sampling, we cannot then necessarily apply the probability theory to do the statistical inferences. Um, one more thing is good to good to mention that uh, sometimes it's it's uh, questions arise. Okay, what if I observe the entire population? So what if I observe all firms in Finland? Would I then also then need to do some kind of inferences? So. Um, very often, even if we even if we observe some uh, all firms in uh, in Finland or all individuals in a country, uh, still we like to think about it as a sample of some kind of a bigger entity. So, for example, we only observe uh, all firms in a given point of time, and uh, and uh, these firms have uh, have uh, done certain kind of decisions, but it doesn't include all this kind of. Uh, possible firms or all kind of thinkable firms that could exist. Uh, so anyway, this, uh, uh, this uh, realizations that we observe in a given point of time in a given country, anyway, it could be thought of as a, as a sample of, uh, of some larger pool of uh, possible firms and possible technologies or possible choices by, by individuals. So even if you, even if you observe all of the uh, firms or all of the individuals in a given point of time in a given region, uh, we can still think about it as a sample of some larger, potentially infinitely large population of all possible technologies or all possible firm configurations and, uh, and designs. So this is why we still, still think that uh, statistical inferences are important. So, um, Another reminder also, because I have used this, uh, this uh, notation, uh, estfar, estcov, 
for the sample variance and sample covariance. Uh, so here on this slide, I also then, then remind you about this uh, formulas for the sample variance and sample covariance that, uh, that uh, we can use for calculating this uh, sample statistics based on our, our observed data. But then for the, for the population variance and population covariance, uh, we would need to uh, calculate some expected value. So if we have a continuous random variable X, then this would require some integral calculus, whereas this, uh, this uh, uh, sample statistics we can, we can use to sum of a discrete number of observations. And uh, usually it uh, in some sense goes without saying, but it's good to highlight it again, that usually this, uh, this logic of uh, drawing statistical inferences based on a sample, uh, the same analog works here also. So typically when we calculate, the, for example, sample average or sample variance or sample covariances based on our observed sample, uh, we don't do that uh, necessarily just for the sake of uh, drawing some descriptive statistics for our sample. So this is often these, um, uh, these uh, sample statistics are introduced mainly as a descriptive statistics in many introductory courses. But now we have a bit more ambitious target of uh, using those kind of uh, statistics to say something about this population uh, and so underlying uh, population mean or population variance or population covariance. So, so this is why this distinction between the sample and population is important. So always, of course, the sample statistics could be used just, uh, just to describe the characteristics of your sample. But when you want to do some kind of uh, inferences to say something about the population, then we need to use some uh, probability theory. So let me also, also illustrate this with this uh, covariance. So Covariance, of course, was very important. You remember that when we calculate the, the slope coefficient of the OLS estimator, we essentially rely on the covariance between X and Y. So I have here generated a simple simulation example with just 10 observations. So I have, I have done it in Excel. Normally, when I, when I have some live classes uh, on site, then I would, uh, I would uh, take at this point the Excel and I would just, uh, just uh, draw this uh, random samples in Excel for you. But uh, on this video lesson, I have done it already. So I will just uh, copy paste uh, some examples from Excel. So on this slide, I have taken this kind of three, three randomly drawn samples. Uh, and in all these three cases, uh, these are totally independent X and Y. So we, there's no connection whatsoever between these X and Y in this data generating process. I know it because I generated this data myself. So this assumption that I state here that covariance is equal to zero, that means the population covariance is equal to zero. There's absolutely no connection between these X and Y variables. But to illustrate this distinction between the sample statistic, I have also then uh, calculated the sample covariance for these samples of 10 observations. So notice that the sample covariance can be quite large positive or negative uh, when we have just 10 observations. So in all three cases, the sample covariance looks fairly large. In the, in the middle case, it is negative, but quite large. So in all these cases, it might look as if there is some kind of uh, uh, correlation between these X and Y variables. But uh, in these simulated examples, there's absolutely no connection between X and Y. So these are just random numbers generated in Excel. Okay, so uh, the fact that the samples, sample covariance is, is something relatively large, it doesn't necessarily imply that, uh, that the underlying, uh, that there is some, some uh, true correlation between the variable. It can be just some, some, some fluke of, uh, of random, random luck. So I have also then, then uh, tried this experiment with uh, 200 observations or 2000 observations uh, so this would be then much longer, longer column. So I have just restricted to some, some smaller number of, uh, of variables, but these are also generated in Excel. So notice then what happens to the sample covariance when we increase the sample, sample size from uh, 10 to, to 200 or 2000. So then in these cases, the sample covariance, the absolute value of sample covariance obviously decreases. And with the 2000 observations, it's as low as 
0 0.052. So we would believe that, of course, as the sample size increases and increases and approaches towards infinity, then the sample uh, covariance should also approach to zero eventually. So, so I wanted to use this example to remind you this, uh, this setting from the introductory statistics that, uh, that this population statistics are not the same as the sample statistics. This kind of statistics like sample covariance we can calculate from the data, but it's not the same as the underlying population statistic. So now if we go back to the context of regression, so remember, of course, this uh, empirical, in the empirical model, this uh, slope coefficient B2, we calculate as the, as the sample covariance between X and Y divided by the sample variance of X. So everything I mentioned before is, of course, uh, of course uh, very relevant. So the question then is, uh, what can we infer about these parameters of the theoretical model. So what can we say about the true beta 2 based on this, our empirical estimate of, uh, of B2? So I will do this, uh, this, uh, this connection formally in the following part of the lecture. So here's the formula that we, we derived already in earlier lesson. So remember that we calculate this uh, slope coefficient B2 in the ordinary least squares estimation we compute it simply as the ratio of the sample covariance of X and Y and uh, sample variance of X, as I mentioned already. So this is what we already formally have, uh, have uh, developed before. And uh, this is what makes this connection to the sample covariance. So I already demonstrated that the sample covariance can be, can be positive or negative, big and small, even when this X and Y are just uh, not correlated at all. In that case, of course, then this true beta 2 should be equal to zero. So here is a practical observation that, uh, that obviously this, uh, this, sam this uh, slope coefficient cannot be calculated if the sample vari of variance of x is equal to zero. In practice, it means that there must be some variation in our explanatory variable x. So if, if our explanatory variable X is just a constant, then, then we cannot calculate the OLS estimator in the first place. And uh, I mentioned here that, uh, that uh, in the Wooldridge uh, textbook, uh, this is actually mentioned as an assumption of the sin single linear regression. So it's assumption number three. And it's often stated as an explicitly as an assumption of the linear regression model. Uh, in my view, it's more like a data, data requirement. So if you do not have any variation in your data, then in some sense, your data is, uh, is useless. It's not that your estimator is useless, but your data is useless in my, my opinion. So I come back to these uh, assumptions of the regression model in more, in more detail in the, in the next lesson, but I already started to make some kind of connections to this uh, stated assumptions of the linear regression model. Okay, let's assume that, uh, that this, uh, this uh, sample statistics can be calculated, so we can calculate the sample covariance of X and Y, and we can calculate the sample variance of X. And for sake of simplicity, I will focus now on the single regression case with one X only. So now let's assume that our theoretical model is correctly specified. So, so let's assume that our data is uh, uh, governed by this uh, this theoretical model so that y is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 times x plus uh, plus epsilon. And uh, if we compare to this uh, assumptions of the Wooldridge text, this is actually the first assumption that uh, Jeffrey Wooldridge is making. So, uh, so uh, everything is in some sense relying on the assumption that we have a correctly specified model. So everything fails if, uh, if the theoretical model model is wrong. But as I mentioned in this uh, uh, previous lesson, uh, in some sense, all models are wrong, but some are, some are useful. So let's, for sake of argument, just assume that our model is correctly specified. So this allows us to, to then uh, insert in place of this Y, I have in included here now this uh, uh, right-hand side of the regression equation. So in the bottom part of the slide, we have this equation where I have now substituted YI by simply beta 1 plus beta 2 x plus epsilon. And same we can also do for this y upper bar, which was just the, 
the sample average of y. So if we take the average of y, it's easy to show that uh, that the average y is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 times sample average of x plus sample average of epsilon. So now I have just plugged in this uh, right-hand side of the regression equation to this uh, uh, closed form solution to our OLS estimator. And we can then continue further to develop this, this expression to gain some insights. So here, this, this formula might look a little bit uh, cryptic and tedious or maybe scary even, but don't worry, it's actually quite, uh, quite simple. For sake of clarity, I have now here used some color codes to, to help, you, help you follow it easier. So I have indicated this uh, intercept uh, term beta 1 by blue color. Then I have used red color for this uh, slope coefficient beta 2 times x. And then I have purple color for the error term epsilon. So everything including these three components I have, I have indicated by the different color. And uh, then I just reorganized the terms in this, uh, this ratio that, uh, that, uh, that uh, we had uh, in the, on the previous slide. So I have just uh, now reorganized this element so that I put these uh, intercept terms beta 1 in the, in the same ratio. Then I organized to a different uh, component these uh, all elements containing beta 2 and x. And then I have the third component that com contains these uh, error terms uh, epsilon. Okay. So now we just can use these uh, uh, rules of the sum. And we can also use this rules of the sigma operator to move from this uh, first exp expression, which is the same as I had on the previous slide, to the second expression, where I now have regrouped everything so that uh, I have this um, uh, beta 1 that comes from this, uh, this first expression and beta 1 that comes from the second expression. So notice that everything that contains this blue color beta 1 Will, will cancel out and they, they will just uh, just go to zero because beta one minus beta one is equal to zero. And if you multiply some uh, x i minus x upper by by zero for each and every observation i, then this, uh, this first, uh, first component simply drops out. And on the third line, I have indicated that this zero refers to this component that refers to this uh, beta one. So that just goes to zero. So then the second one is this red colored element. So, so that's the second part of the sum. And uh, notice that here we have now a slope beta 2. And uh, I have collected these terms because this beta 2 is uh, in both in this xi and x upper bar. So, so we can then rewrite this as, as beta 2 times xi minus x upper bar. Uh, I have now here skipped some intermediate steps, but notice that, uh, that of course, uh, if you have xi minus x upper bar multiplied by xi minus x upper bar, so it is just xi minus x upper bar to power 2. Okay, so we have also xi minus x upper bar in the nominator of the ratio, but it's also in the denominator of the ratio. So therefore, we can also move this constant beta to to the left hand side of this, uh, this uh, sum operator. So we can take this beta 2 outside the sum operator. So what we have left is then beta 2 times the sum of xi minus x upper bar to power 2 divided by the sum of xi minus x upper bar to power 2. So then all of these components containing x will cancel out. And on the, on the final last row, we have just, we have just this constant beta 2. So if you follow these steps carefully, I think you will, can verify that these x, x variables just uh, drop out from the second, second term. And then as the third item, we have this uh, error term epsilon and epsilon upper bar, which are indicated with the purple color. And for that final part, in fact, we cannot do anything, anything else to simplify, simplify that part. Okay, so now I go to the to the interpretation. So notice that uh, that uh, we have now managed to actually with this couple of simple uh, simple simple uh, manipulations of the formula, 
we have managed to establish a connection between our empirical slope coefficient b2 that we estimate from our data and the theoretical beta 2 that is unobserved but but we want to make some inferences so we have now established that uh, that uh, our OLS estimator b2 is equal to the true beta 2 plus some kind of error component and in fact if you use the same same ideas as as we had before so notice that we can actually think about this uh, this uh, uh, if you take a, take this ratio of this uh, this uh, x i minus x upper bar multiplied by epsilon i minus epsilon upper bar and sum over all i so if we divide this uh, this sum by n minus 1 we have actually the sample covariance between x and epsilon and and in the same way if we take this uh, uh, denominator of x i minus x upper bar to power 2 and summed over all observations if we divide that sum by n minus 1 we have just sample variance of x so indeed we can then interpret that our OLS estimator b2 is equal to the true beta 2 plus an error term that is equal to the sample covariance between x and epsilon and the sam and the sample variance of x and uh, this has kind of very uh, important implications for our our estimation so so when we are ultimately interested in estimating this beta 2 but what we have is actually our empirical b2 this equation demonstrates that uh, our beta 2 um, sorry our our empirical b2 comes closer to this uh, beta 2 uh, whenever the sample covariance between x and epsilon is closer to the zero so the further away the sample covariance is from the zero the larger this estimation error however uh, the sample variance of uh, of x variable also dampens this effect so so it's the sample covariance of x and epsilon is proportional to the sample variance of x so when x has large sample variance when there are there is large variation in our explanatory variable then uh, this error is proportionately smaller. So these are both valuable insights that we can then later, later utilize for our, our statistical inferences. So, so far we have just established a formal connection between our empirical slope coefficient b2 and our theoretical slope coefficient beta2. So this is very useful result for further developments. So before we can then go in more detail to the to the statistical properties and statistical inferences we then need to make some kind of assumptions about the data generating process i already referred to some assumptions but those were in my mind more like technical requirements that of course you need to have some some variation in your dependent variable otherwise you cannot even calculate your ols slope coefficient so i will next uh, review in more detail the the textbook assumptions for I, I use the text of Wooldridge and then, then prove some properties and starting from the finite sample properties. Okay, so I'll see you in the next lesson.